Hey guys, what's going on? This is David Avalon with Breaking the Guard with my co-host Robert Drysdale and a very special guest, Alberto Crane. Alberto, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thank you, David. Thank you, Robert. Big pleasure, big honor. Excited. Damn, man. Thank you for being on here. We're really excited to uh, uh, talk to you, man. Like, I, I feel like I've known you, Alberto, for like since I've been, since I was like maybe like a blue belt and We've never spent a lot of time together. Back, but like I've always, I've always like seen you at tournaments in Brazil, tournaments in the U.S. Like we go way back. Um, but um, yeah, man. So I'm excited to have you on our on our podcast here. We're we're gonna pick your brain and you know find out like what's kept you going in jujitsu all these years, the good and the bad. You know, and yeah, that's 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 the nature of this, this podcast. We try to get to like the bottom of things. Like, what is it that keeps you going, and what is it that you love? Not just on the sure. sure. Yeah, not on the superficial level, like at the bottom of everything. Like, why do you keep coming back and why do you form from this art? So, thank you for being here. And I know, uh, speaking of yeah, that, thank uh, you. Alberto, I know you've gone through, I mean, you're an OG. You've been around for a long time, not just in Jiu Jitsu and MMA. And uh, I know you've gone through medical issues as well, which most people might have just stopped mm -hmm. right there. and you've only seemed to have persevered of, and become better for it. So I don't know if you could share a little bit about your, your backstory. For sure. For sure. You know, uh, you know, when I back in, I'll, I'll start, you know, when, in the mid nineties, you know, I fell in love with, well, in 94, I started Jiu Jitsu and then, you know, I, I, I fell in love with it and, and, and uh, ended up moving to Brazil, like, and uh, with my pursuit to try to be one of the best and, and uh, you know, and then just, Kept, kept at it, you know, kept at it. I read a book called Think and Grow Rich, you know, by Napoleon Hill. Yeah. And I set my blueprint up and, uh, you know, the mastermind principle. And so I knew where I had to go. And that, that was Brazil to become one of the best, you know, in my, in my mind, you know. So that's what I did. I moved to Brazil and, and, uh, had it. Uh, so, uh, oh, uh, the journey that I, uh, learn on the mats can can you hear me yeah i think and i just interrupted you like i think i lost the sound i thought you went silent my bad okay 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 uh, were, you, were you gonna say something no. yeah I, no i was just gonna ask you like but i didn't realize you had to finish because i thought that you went silent so I, I interrupted you accidentally so you can go ahead and finish the thought mm -hmm. and then i'll no go back and yeah no basically everything 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 like any success i've had is because of that time in Brazil, you know, in my pursuit to, to become the best, you know, uh, every, every success, every heartache, every, any, any difficult I've ever had and any success I've had is because of those, those, those times in Brazil, you know, so I'm, I'm forever grateful, you know, and, and I, you know, I do jujitsu, but for me, it's always going to be Brazilian jujitsu, you know, just because of the culture and, and what is it for me, you know, as you know, just even even like the culture, it's like very warm and the, the connections I have with my friends still to this day, you know, from those times, uh, it's just, it's never going to go away from me. You know, that's something that Robert has said a lot too. Um, I mean, myself, I've only been to Brazil once and it was a really short, not great experience. <laughs> They, they flew me in like on a red eye flight <laughs> and had to fight Zanja in the first match and then fly out <laughs> right afterwards. So that, that kind of sucked me. But I know that, you know, Robert always talked about the difference in the, as far as the Brazilian culture, you know. And so, yeah. and, and both of you are Americans, you know, or Robert, you know, half American, half Brazilian. But maybe yeah. you can share a little bit more on that, like to people like me who are not like really immersed in the Brazilian culture, like what makes it so unique? I mean, for me, you know, I was, I was 18, you know, when I first went down there and, uh, you know, I was, you know, raised by a single mom. I had the influence of my dad too, but I think I did for sure. I was like missing, missing a part of that. And, uh, I just kind of filled in the gaps and filled in, filled in things maybe that, that I was lacking, you know, from maybe my childhood or just as a, as a person, you know, and just the the human connection that I that I received from everybody and the 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 deep bonds, you know. I mean, most of my really close friends they're they're from that time, you know, like twenty five years, right? Twenty five years, and I'm, you know, I have, I have those friends still to today, like they're we're really close. So uh, that's, that's something, you know, that's special, you know. So uh, so I really I really take it, I take I hold it dear to my heart, and uh, it's my motivation for sure, you know, one of my motivations. 
Congratulations. Awesome. So, uh, Alberto, let, let me ask you this. That's pretty brave. First of all, that takes a lot of courage to leave a country where you're from and go into a strange country when you're 18. I'm assuming you didn't speak Portuguese at the time. I know you speak Portuguese now, but at the time you did. And so, like, kudos for that, man. It's like legit commitment. I think a lot of people miss out on, like, when you want some price you have to pay, and you clearly right. paid it. But let me ask you this. Why did you choose? Can you enter Belo Horizonte in Minas Gerais, right, with Draculini? Mm -hmm. Now, Minas Gerais has never been a hub for jiu-jitsu. There's some talent there, but it's always been Rio, Manaus, and then later Sao Paulo kind of a little bit. But like, mm -hmm. why did you choose Minas Gerais, and why did you choose Draculini? That's a great, that's a great question. You know, um, so I met Jack Lino when I went to Rio de Janeiro. I first went from, from New Mexico. I moved to Rio de Janeiro, went to Baja de Tijuca. And, uh, like I was Grace Ball, I was like first American black belt. And so I went there and I met him and I just loved his, uh, just his personality and how he was. And then I went to go visit his school when he was beginning, just beginning. It was like white belt and white belts and blue belts. Yeah. And, uh, just the culture in the school was just, it just resonated with me, you know? And I was like, this is where I want to go, you know, because, it, you know, at the Grace of Baja in Rio de Janeiro, it was like, you know, like the, the who's who was there, right? Like, all, and there's probably like five, six world champions at, at a time on the on the mat training, you know? Um, but uh, but uh, for whatever reason, the the, 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 the guys that I, that I connected with, you know, I was, a, I was a white belt, blue belt at that time, you know? So, uh, so it just, it just kind of resonated with me and I, I've always gone, gone on my instincts, you know, and my instinct told me to, to move there. You know, I felt like I was going to get a lot more from that experience than maybe being, even being in the, in the, in the readers, readers Janeiro at the Grace of Baja. And it turned out to be, you know, because I got like, you know, personal attention and I felt like I was part of the team, you know, in Rio de Janeiro, there's a lot of foreigners, right. Coming in and out. Right. But in Bella Rizanche, there weren't obviously that many foreigners. So I really felt like a part of the team and, that was a part of my, like, just the simulation, you know, into the culture, you know, um, um, being in Belo Horizonte, you know, because like I said, there weren't that many foreigners there. Um, but it resonated with me, just to answer your question, you know, just the, the culture and the way Draculino was as a person and his, his professionalism and just technique and just how he was as a person. Interesting. And it, and it, it turned out to be a good call, you know, because, I mean, look at, look at all the Black Belt World Champions that came out of there. You know, one school, one school, you know. I mean, I mean, Samuel Braga, Hamel Bahal. I mean, those, those are later, even later generations. Eric Vandelay. I mean, there's just so many, so you know, so many guys, you know, that have come come out of there, you know, over the years, you know. So it, uh, it was, it was really the right choice, you know. It was really the right choice, and I, I really excelled there. I really excelled there, and you know, we got to beat a lot of the, you know, as a as a black belt team, but the, you know, the Brazilian day keeps, you know. In 2002, like we even got to beat Allianz as a lightweight team. You know, we were like the first lightweight team to ever beat to win a Brazilian Keeps. You know, at uh, you know at the black belt level, lightweight. You know, first time ever. You know, I, I, I'm sorry, a team outside of out of outside of Rio de Janeiro. So that was that was pretty cool. You know, and we, you know Leo Vieira, all those guys were on that team at that time. So it was cool. You know, like we were, we were legit. You know, and uh, yeah, I'm very proud. You know, to be a part of that 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 lineage and and, and legacy you know that's amazing amazing story i know like draculino like i i'm like very observant of this stuff like i've always put draculino as one of the best jujitsu coaches of all time because i know all these names i i grew up like watching them i know who they are yeah I know accomplishments is he doesn't get the maybe he doesn't get the credit he deserves but like you have to put him as a top five like I, there's for sure he goes, he goes like for sure. Zeppel, uh, julius caesar um you know, Draculino, like some of these guys. And then, like, you, you there's like, maybe 10, top, there's too many good out there. But he definitely belongs in the top five, top 10 of the greatest jiu-jitsu coaches of all time, in my opinion. For sure. I mean, if you want to look at numbers, okay, who's put out more black world champions than, than him? The one guy, you know, one guy. Like, a lot of, a lot of schools, right, they have, like, multiple, like, you know, multiple influences, you know. But from one school, like, I mean, yeah, Hajolo was, he's amazing, right? He's from, from the North, but let's count how many guys, you know? Uh, Draculino, I mean, I, I don't even know how many Black World Champions. Yeah. You know, really, all the way from blue to black. So, I mean, you have to. I think you have to. And I think uh, just because he's always been, like, talk about his character and his integrity, 
he's always stayed loyal to, to Carlos Gracie Jr. And so I, I think maybe he doesn't he's got he hasn't gotten like the recognition per se, you know, because of that. I don't know. I don't know. But uh it doesn't matter, you know. <laughs> I benefited from it and a lot of others have, you know, and uh and so you know, it's all good, you know. <laughs> but uh, he keeps I mean look at Lucas Valente, you know. Uh yeah. he got the you know, he got the silver medal at the, at the world championship this year, you know, how many generations is that? And he's there with, in Texas with Chuck, you know, you know, like he went zero, zero against uh, Lucas, Lepre, you know, right. Zero, zero. Like, you know, I mean, the best guard passer, right. In the game. And he didn't pass his guard. I mean, honestly, I've never seen anybody pass his guard, seen, uh, seen anybody pass his kid's guard, but, uh, but, uh, you know, it's just, they keep coming, you know, they keep coming, you know, and that's all, all like, you know, all the grace of all guys, really, like, the, the lineage, it's all from, like, Jack Lee, you know. And then Zeh Hagiola, right, when he was still a part. So let me ask you this, then. Like, whenever I see someone who's, like, who has a, they're a coach that's produced so many champions and churning them out, there's always a formula, right? Because they're able to put talent in and then out comes a champ. So if I was to ask, what do you think is, like, the – the formula or the secret sauce, so to speak, that Draculino is doing that perhaps maybe other people are not doing. Man, I, I just did a podcast with actually with Lucas Valente today. Was it today or yesterday? You know, and we we're talking about that. And uh, it's not even like the world champion black belts, but like man, there's like attorneys and 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 it's just he 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 his example, right? He like trains hard, he pushes us, um, and uh, like it just brings everybody up you know there's guys that aren't world have won world championships but they're like super super they're like world-class guys you know attorneys and you know they're attorneys that have other responsibilities right but they're like super they're you know they're super high level um and so i think it's just the culture that's in the school you know just everybody gets treated the same you know just the the his like his character again you know um of just pushing pushing everybody and and just his example you know he was like a world-class competitor himself and then, uh, and then, um, you know, I just kind of put that into us, you know, we we're all, he was pretty young when he started the gym, you know, in, in, in Bella Rizanche by himself. And, uh, you know, he put his heart and soul into, into us, you know, and, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing, you know, it's really, it's amazing, you know, like we're on these group chats, right. And the guys are still, still super interconnected, right. After all these years, 25 years, you know, 25 years, That's a long time. It's, not, it's not, it's not about the money. It's like, it's like, it's like a deep connection and respect, you know, because he's always, he's always been there for us. He always does the right thing. Like, you know, just, you know, just, he's, the, he's such a great role model and example. I think that's a good point you bring because you even talk about you choosing to go there to Mina Heras. It wasn't because, oh, they have all these world champions or all these black belts. You, you just really stress the importance of the character and like the the values of the gym, and I think that's something that a lot of people can learn from. Because you know, you might be in the Midwest or something, and you don't have access to the high level of talent. But that's not necessarily the most important thing. I mean, we can look at social media, and we can find plenty of scumbag black belts. <laughs> you know, yeah. That even though they yeah. might be well accomplished, they're they lack character. You know, and we could I think we could all say that if there's one thing that we want to take away from the martial arts is the the virtues of like you said like character honor integrity and not so much like i can have like x amount of trophies behind me on the wall mm. yeah yeah you know like he was uh he was in a, he became an attorney right and then he chose the jiu-jitsu the jiu-jitsu path right instead he could have chosen to be an attorney to become an attorney but he chose the jiu-jitsu path instead and so he was always like, you know, back in those days, it was kind of like the fight, like fight club days in a lot of ways, you know. And he was always a professional, always like a super clean gi, always presented himself as a professional. And I was just like I said, he's like, again to he's such a great role model to 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 want to be like, right? Uh, and so all of us, really, all of us, like we're all like the lineage kind of keeps going, you know. People having successful schools and uh, you know having good students, but you know also running a professional. Uh, school, you know, for for the community, you know, doing positive work in the community, and I think uh, I think more than anything, you know, I mean, of course, it's it's great to have like black belt world champions and and all these things, you know, but man, like just doing good work in the community, solid work, you know, really changing people's lives and helping people be their best, you know, man, he he, 
I mean, that's what it's all about. And then all the other things just kind of fell in place, you know, because of the right timing, you know, like, like uh, Robert was saying, you know, but Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo later on were like, you know, were like hubs, you know, but Bella Rizanche was, didn't really have it until kind of he went there. Right. And so it was like the perfect, the perfect storm to kind of, you know, kind of create all this talent in that city. On a, on a side yeah. note, did you know that Bella Rizanche was the first place where Carlos Gracie taught jiu-jitsu? You know, I've I've seen that. Yeah, I've seen that for the, yeah. for the police, right? The civil civil police is civil. Yeah. yeah. So 1928 before yeah. some before Rio. But let me ask you this: So you mentioned why he why he is. Um, I mean, you, he's a good coach, right? So he does the right things. He cares about us. He's always there for us. Obviously, he has a lot to offer in terms of development of, of athletes. You know, the facts are there to prove it. My question to you is, like, the, the why that I want to get to is what is about his mind and personality that give him that edge? Because it's not easy. If it were easy, everyone would do it, right? Like, there's a number of things right. that come to play here. Like, so many things have to align for you to be that level of a coach. And it has to be I mean, with his mindset and personality, right? That's where I'm going with this. Yeah, yeah. You know, he has, like, he's, like, a light, super lightweight guy, right? You know, he's a, he's a pluma, pluma penna, penna, penna weights, right? So featherweight. And, uh, and uh, man, he can put us all in our place, you know, with the way he, he speaks, the, his personality. And, you know, if somebody's doing something wrong, he'll, he'll put them in, in their place, you know, like right away. And, you know, people listen, you know. And so that's a leadership quality, right? And uh, he's always fair, um, you know, and just kind of going back to the integrity again, you know, just he's always fair and he does like the right thing, you know. And no, nobody's perfect, right? But, I mean, that's like year after year after year, even no matter what, you know, like he's still, no matter what team, if we're part of Grace of Allah or not, you know, he's still, he's still there for us, you know, for his black belts. Because uh, it's not about that, you know. It's about like the the, the relationship and and you know the, the the things that we went through together, you know. So, you know, I, I think it, it, if you have to say one, it's his it's his personality and the, the way you know the, the way he is, you know, the way he is. So of course, like the integrity and all that, but his personality, right? Being able to put us in our place with the way he he speaks uh, really well, he the way he communicates, you know, he's you know, it's, he's able to communicate really efficiently right teaching uh, and then also putting us in our place right uh, which we which we needed right which we need <laughs> i guess being a need lawyer has a benefits right of being able to argue <laughs> <laughs> let, let me ask you um uh about the uh you mentioned that you know okay, well, he puts people in his place and he so he has like that sort of like obviously a very vocal person like he has the characteristics of a leader is my point right yeah but yeah, at yeah. the same right. time he is very very loyal to Carlinos Gracie Jr. he has been over the years in a moment where Gracie Bach is like this big question mark in the BJJ world because they've gone a route that is unusual but it's what works for every business on the planet so are they right or there's a conflict of the BJJ business side and the BJJ culture that we cherish so much. And I feel Gracie Ba has always sit on the crossroads of those two things. And, and, but Draculino has stayed loyal over the years. He's like one of the few guys from the old time. Like Gordo left, Zehajiola left, uh, Pejipano left, Roger left, Henzo left, Kira left. So many members of what was the biggest team in the world left. And Draculino might be the last of the Mohicans, of like the old school Gracie Baja guys. That for is sure, real. for sure. Why is that? You know, his, his, his character, you know, he's like a samurai, straight up, you know. He's like, he's, he's loyal, he's loyal, and he, you know, he's, it's his example, right? He's an example to us. And so, uh, you know, even when, when I, I'm not part of the Grace of All Association anymore, but he even told me straight up, like, you know, I think it's better for you to, to, not, be a, to but not be a part of it, you know. So I was like, okay, sounds good, you know. Uh, and I told my wife, and you know, it was great. <laughs> Everything was good. But I was, you know, as, as soon as he gave me his blessing, pretty much, okay, I was good with that, you know. But it's an example of make, you know, you lead by, you copy, right? You copy your, your teacher, you copy your professor. So um, why is he loyal? It's his, his character. His character is like a samurai, and, you know, it's, that's, that's part of who he is. And uh, Alberto, I know I've had the privilege of going to your school several times and training there and teaching and stuff. And I've always 
had a great time. And I would, I would have to say that Lineage has obviously passed well because you're super awesome and all your students and coaches that I've always worked with have been very humble and, and very easy to work with. And I know you, you've had a lot of success with your gym. And, uh, and the smoothie bar is amazing, too. The acai, <laughs> the sandwiches, also really good. I brought, I brought, I brought BB Sucos to, uh, to, uh, to Los Angeles, to Burbank. <laughs> oh, nice. So, I mean, talk to us a little bit about that, because I know as a competitor, and maybe we should talk first about that, because we haven't talked about you yet, you know, but I know you, you've done very well in jiu-jitsu. I, I, I know you from MMA first, when you were fighting in King of the Cage. So I think mm. when I started getting into this in the eight, late 90s and stuff, you were the champ mm. of King of the Cage. So, like, yeah, when did you make that switch? Yeah. Yeah, when when you went from I guess from Brazil training jiu jitsu into going to MMA, you know, so like in two thousand two, um, like I, I closed the bracket, a black belt, and so I, I guess in my mind I was like, oh, yeah, I, you know, because I beat the I beat the guy that I had to beat, and we closed the bracket, you know, but uh, uh, um, that was like my goal, you know, but we closed the bracket, and later on, it's it's, it's not it, it's not like that. It's whoever gets that first uh, place is like the world champ, right? So I probably would have kept going if that was if that was the case. But around that time, King of the Cage came to New Mexico, and uh, so I wanted to. Once I got my black belt, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to test it out and see if this stuff works, you know, in the cage. And so because they're coming, King of the Cage back then was a big deal, right? They were competing yeah. with the UFC, you know. Um, hold on one second. Uh, and so they're competing with the UFC, and. Um, um, yeah, so that fact that they came to New Mexico, I was living in New Mexico at the time. Um, um, they came to New Mexico at the time that I was able to, I was able to get on the card, right? And uh, I did one fight, two fights, and then because I sold so many tickets, you know, the first fight, for example, I went and, you know, I was always like, you know, hustling a little bit, you know, but I was able, I was getting a commission off of uh, off the tickets, you know, but not, I was getting paid like what three hundred bucks or something, right? And so yeah. I went in and I bought, I bought you know, like 10,000 bucks worth of tickets. And then I sold them all out of my gym because it was the first time I actually competed in, in New Mexico. So, you know, everybody supported me. And, uh, and then and then they're like, okay, like instead of me being like one of the maybe undercards, you know, they like, okay, like they wanted to make me like pretty much like the main event after that. Like thanks to everyone and these guys, these guys were on the card. And so then October came around. And uh, yeah, they, they didn't even do it because I didn't fight on the card. I was like, because they, they didn't, you know, they didn't want to pay me 400 bucks. right? <laughs> and so they're like, we'll give you a, we'll give you a title shot uh, to fight like uh, Javier Vasquez. Cause the first time Javier Vasquez came to New Mexico and he had the belt on, he had just beaten Romino Sato, who was the first lightweight, like mm -hmm. superstar. Right. Yeah. So he was kind of, uh, you know, he's kind of like, he was like Hannes Horace and, and he kind of acted, uh, stuck up, you know, towards me. And so, you know, I'd com com committed to, you know, to being the best and, and, uh, and all that for so many years, you know. And so I felt like super insulted, you know, because I'm always really nice, you know. But then when somebody acts like kind of like, uh, you know, cocky with you, right, uh, you know, you know <laughs> it rubs you the wrong way, you know. So the match, I knew that. And so they're like, listen, we'll give you a, a title shot for the King of the Cage if you do this next fight. We can't pay you anymore, but we'll give you the title shot. I was like, sounds good, you know? And so that's how, like, the that pay-per-view was a big pay-per-view. And, and he was, like, very, he was very high up on the, on the you know, on the, on the, on the, on the list, you know? Uh, he, was gonna, he was about to fight in the UFC, which it was a big, big deal back in those days. They only had, like, maybe five cards, you know, throughout the year. So, yeah. you know, he, and he was, he, he was really, like, kind of full of himself at that time, you know? And, I mean, he, he was on an up and up, you know? He was, like, considered top ten and all that in the in the rankings you know for for the weight you know so anyway I went in there and he was you know i had a really good team you know i like greg jackson and mike winkle john and mike corner and and of course i had like the whole, all of new mexico behind me you know my school in santa fe and then you know all the jackson people too in albuquerque so it was like everybody was like chanting my name and this it it's cool man it's cool and it you know went to the went the distance and yeah, I had a lot of things in my favor for sure, considering that it was only my like third fight, you know. But it kind of got put me on the map, you know, as far as in MMA, even though it was only my third fight, you know. And I was just straight up, a straight up jujitsu guy with with big, big balls, you know, trying to trying to prove <laughs> prove, you know. <laughs> and and I did like high level jujitsu things, you know. I did like 
half guard sweeps and I did like, and he was a grappler and he was a grappler at the end of the day. So, you know, when, when shit hits the fan, you know, like you do what you do, you know, you do what you do best, you know? And so he grappled me, you know, I just threw big head kicks. I didn't know how to strike or anything. And he just, you know, he clinched with me. Right. And it became a grappling match. So, and then I, I thought I was just a little bit better, you know? I mean, I was, I was at the top of the top of my game at that time, you know? So that it got me on the map, you know? And then the UFC of course wanted me to fight. And then I took a hiatus, you know, for, for two and a half years because they got rid of the division, the lightweight division. Right. And, uh, and so I was like, you know, I just focused on my school. And so I, you know, started studying, you know, the, from the karate guys and the, you know, the guys that are doing good business things because, you know, I put everything into like being the best, but it doesn't pay the bills. You know, you come back from the tournaments and you're like starving, you know? And, yeah. uh, you know, one of the, it was actually the ADCC trials that your brother won in, uh, outside of Vancouver. Right. It was yeah. like that tournament where, you know, I got, I actually lost to Javier Vasquez. It was after that, um, um, you know, we went to the finals. It was like, you know, it was like, it went like, I don't know, 20 minutes or whatever, 30, whatever it was, you know, and it was like, you know, the zero, zero. I don't even know, you know, what the, how it went, you know. <laughs> anyway, it didn't matter. Like the, mat, the, the thing was like, I put everything into being the best. I cut down to 145 and all that. And then like, you come back and it doesn't mean anything. Like you're starving, you know, and it's like, what am I doing? You know, and so I, sat, I stayed up like all night talking with my, you know, Mal Easton, one of my best friends. He's like my big brother that, that actually took me down to Brazil when I was, you know, I was, I was a kid. And uh, he talked about creating systems, you know, and I started reading like the E-Myth, he told me the E-Myth and just different things. And so I, you know, I, I got with, I kind of used the same format, you know, I, like I t told you, I, I read Think and Grow Rich when I was like 18 and I, I used that as my blueprint to go to Brazil and try to become the best. And uh, so that I, I just kind of did the same formula, you know, to, to try to, create a good business because there was nobody to men be mentored from in the jiu-jitsu community the only guys were the karate guys right that were doing good business yeah. you know even lord irving even lord irving was there right uh at that at that seminar that i, that I took it was like this guy steven oliver i remember that was like one of yep. the first ones i did and Malachi there was karate. uh there yeah. was uh yeah that's it and uh he they there was like the fat guys in the in the front lord lloyd wasn't fat right but the fat guy fat karate guys in the front and he said, they're like, who's done 5,000 hours of technical training? And, you know, everybody raised their hand, right? Who's done 5,000 5, hours of marketing and sales? And the fat guy, only the fat guy, karate guys, front and Lloyd Irving raised their hand, you know? And I was like, uh, okay, that's what I got to do, you know? So I just began to study, you know, and uh, start to study, you know, start to learn and try to become better. And, and then I had like the Ultimate Fighter came out and I remember Lloyd gave me like a 30-day 30 day, you know, like commercial and I got it on, on the, on the, I start, you know, so I started, you know, implementing stuff in the school, started, started doing, doing really well. You know, I, I, I copied a lot of this, these, these formulas, you know, and, uh, and then I even created, I started a second school and I did the, I used the 30 day free, like, um, I did a 30 second commercial during the ultimate fighter and it was super cheap cause they didn't know what was going to happen. So I got a super cheap and so it blew up my second school. But, you know, I just started studying, you know, and, and implementing and doing it, you know. One thing is to study, but another thing is to actually do it, you know. So I just do shit up on the wall, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, that's what you were saying. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, that's what I did, you know. And, uh, and uh, you know, I did, did, did really well, you know. And, uh, and I was able to, and I, and I met, my, met my wife, you know, and that's why I live in L.A. now. Um, you know, I knew I was going to have, I was going to move to L.A. eventually, you know. Um, and, uh, so we kind of, kind of built up the business as well, as well, you know, so I could, you know, I could maybe get some money to start, start a new life in Los Angeles. Cause money's a little bit different here than New Mexico. You know, it's a lot more expensive and anyway, yeah. you know, I, I was, I did good. And, you know, I, I was grateful cause I got to, I got, I learned a lot, you know, in the process, you know, and of course I was doing other things, but you know, it's like, it's like the same formula, right? It's the same, like the same, the same thing, the same mindset, the same, the same things, you know, it's just doing it, you know, like going to brazil like just pulling the trigger and actually doing it right uh not talking about it but actually doing it like buying my, buying my plane ticket like selling selling everything i have and actually going going and doing it and so you know same thing with uh with the business same thing is with like investing and uh making making moves to you know to not just to have to rely on the school business itself right uh to set you up because that'll you know for me like jiu-jitsu is everything you know uh, no matter what I do, like you just is always going to be number one because what it's done for me. And I want to, I always want to be connected and, 
and you know, I want to be like Jack Lino, like my, my professor, you know, and be on the mat and really care and be connected with all the students. You know, it's always going to be very, very important to me um, um, for my happiness, you know, and peace of mind. Yeah, you know, um, I was going to ask you, Alberto, also, I know you're very passionate about the, uh, this fitness training that you're doing, which is tag fit, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, tell me a little bit, and, and Robert, uh, your journey, why did you get started with yeah. that? Yeah, so, know? so yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. So, you know, uh, you know, so I got into the UFC, right, and um, lost my first fight, and then, uh, you know, uh, my first jiu-jitsu coach, who was like a Navy SEAL, he, he actually got in touch with the creator of that tactic system. Um, and he's like, would you, would you, could you help Alberto uh, for the, his next fight, you know, his strength and conditioning? And uh, he said, sure. He was like a fan, actually, because he was a grappler himself. And so then uh, he, he, we did a whole protocol and it was like super smart, you know. I wasn't really ready for it, you know, because it was very, very different kind of movements and things like that. Uh, but one of the things that really, really stuck with me is I got thrown on my head. And this is probably like 2007, you know, and uh, instead of, you know, having to take, it was really, really bad. You know, I got like, I think like sweet plate and like, it's just like my neck was, it was jacked, you know. And anytime somebody touched my head, you know, and I had a fight coming up, right. Um, it would just be, it would just be unbearable. And whether, you know, normally it takes like, and you can't rest really, but, you know, it takes like, you know, like a month or. Who knows, you know, how long, you know, to really, and then it never really heals, right? Um, and so uh, I told him, and he's like, man, do these movements, you know, do these movements. And I did them, and uh, he's like, every time you have a pain, you have pain, just do the movements. I was staying out of pain, and he just showed me these movements. And, man, I was able to heal myself within, like, a week, you know, and I was back 100%. And that was, like, that one thing that I never forgot. And I was like, what? I can heal myself with movement? Because usually, usually you have to take, like, pain pills, right? And then just, like, you have to rest and, you know, the same you know, you know, we, nobody, nobody shows us like the right things, you know? And I was like, what? I can help heal myself with movement and, you know, breath and, you know, these, you know, actually natural stuff. Right. And so anyway, it's something that I never, never forgot, you know? And so fast forward 2000, you know, uh, 2000, whatever, 10 to that, when I get the, I, I took, it was a five years. So five years later, uh, I get, uh, I get, um, um, every five years I make you do the brain MRI. Um, I went in and they said, you know, Hey, you have a bunch of lesions in your brain. And they found like a smaller one when, when I first got into UFC, but they let me fight. And then I didn't think anything of it. I was like, okay, sure. And let me fight. But five years later, they, the, these lesions are pretty big, you know? And they're like, Hey, we can't let you fight. We need to do more testing. And it took about, you know, about three, four months for them to do them. And, and they say, sorry, you have multiple sclerosis, you know? And, uh, everybody treated me like, you know, like, like my life's over. You know, like my life's over. They gave me a stack of drug books. Let me know what you want to take, you know, and then you start to look it up and there, you see people in a wheelchair and, you know, like kind of craziness, you know, like my life's basically over. Like everything I've, I love to do everything that I'm about. Like I cannot do it anymore. I'm going to be a cripple. I'm going to have to, somebody's going to have to take care of me. Like everything I'm not, you know, somebody's going to have to take care of me. And so, you know, I was like, can I still do jujitsu? And he said, he said yes you know and so i registered for a tournament and i went on a world tour i was like what if i can't do it in six months and so i registered for every single tournament i went on a world tour you know uh i went all over the world like every place i went like to europe and we even went into the amazon i went to asia you know all over the country you know i i did everything you know gi no gi like uh the way absolutes you know and uh for about three and a half years and uh like the culmination was uh, I had like the Nogi world and Eduardo Talos was in it and he was always a heavier weight, you know, and he had just won like the Nogi world a couple of years before that. <laughs> so in my mind, I was like, oh, this is legit. You know, this is like a real world championship. It was like a master's two, you know, uh, and he was on the opposite side of the bracket, you know, and then we won the first day and then we ended up meeting up in the, in the finals, you know, and uh, it was, uh, it was really cool. I, you know, I, I got to win and it was, it meant a lot to me. He was on the cover of that Jiu-Jitsu magazine. So in my mind, it built it up like it was legit, you know. Um, and, uh, and then I told my friend that I would do a seminar with him in Spain, um, you know, a few weeks after that, you know, cause we, he actually came up for that tournament. And, uh, so there was a couple tournaments while that, during that, that, that week of the seminar. So I, you know, I went to, I went, there was one in Berlin and one in Madrid, Spain. So that was on right, right after the, uh, the seminar and Berlin, I did some seminars 
and I went to Walder's gym, you know, you know, Walder, right, Robert in Stockholm, uh, yep. Sweden. Yeah. And so then I went to, then I went to, you know, we went to Marbella in the South of Spain. And then my last stop was Madrid. And so I, uh, I, uh, I wasn't feeling good. Like the night before I couldn't really eat, you know, and I thought maybe I was just tired from all the stress. Cause I was, this is my third week competing in a row. Right. And, uh, and, um, and so then, you know, I was like, okay, whatever I couldn't eat. And then the next morning I still didn't feel good. And, uh, you know, I couldn't eat anything. And then I talked to my first opponent and, we're cool. And then, you know, we had, we, we went to compete and I started my move, you know, and then his weight kind of dropped on my stomach and I was like, Oh man, I'm going to throw up, you know? And I survived the match and I, you know, went, made it to the end, but I didn't throw up. And as soon as the match was over, it was a, it was a bracket of three people. Right. And so as soon as the match was over, like I threw up, you know, like, you know, I had food poisoning, basically I had food poisoning. Yeah. And so I was just like, I was like a ghost, you know? And then I had one more match because I, I didn't get DQ'd, so I would have been out of the bracket. So they were like, you want to go? I was like, let's go, you know? And I, I went, and I was just trying to win when I wanted to, when I watched the video, but I ended up getting choked out. And I had never been choked out ever in training or, you know, well, for whatever reason, you know, uh, training or any in the match or anything. And I got, cho I, I got choked to sleep, you know? And I woke up, and I was super, like, bummed out, you know? Super, like, defeated, like, mentally and everything. And then the guy that I competed against first. He's like, Hey, you're going to do the open weight. I'm like, nah, man, you know, I'm like, I'm just, I was, you know, I didn't feel good. Right. I couldn't eat. I can drink. You know, just felt like I had no strength at all. And so then, uh, we, we was, he was like, just maybe, put your name down. Maybe you feel better in a couple hours. I was like, okay. I thought about it. I was like, okay, you're right. So I put my name down. I was like, what am I going to do? Stay at the hotel room and feel sorry for myself or maybe I will feel better in a couple hours, you know? And I didn't, you know, but I started to, I sat down and I waited, you know, and I started to kind of think like, I really believe my technique. And I started like a mantra in my head. I believe my technique. I believe my technique, like kind of like, like I started obsessing on it, you know, and I started to feel better and better, you know, like I started to feel good at least, you know, not so bad. And I did that for like a couple of hours, you know, and then I went and I won my first match and like, you know, I'm, I'm, I was feeling terrible. Like I had no strength at all, you know, and I, it was open weight, you know, some, there's a, there's a couple of big guys in there, you know, and, uh, and then I had another match and I had like three matches, you know, and ended up winning the whole thing, you know, and, uh, it doesn't it was just a, like a little tournament, right? Madrid, Madrid open, IBGF. But, uh, because I did that with, with like, with nothing in me, I was like, it just showed me like the, the capability of the mind, what we're capable of, what we're capable of. I had no strength, I had nothing in me, I had nothing in me. It was just my mindset and like me saying the same things over and over my head. And it was just my mind, like my thoughts, you know, that was my, that was the only fuel I had. And it was enough, you know, it was enough. And it got me through it. And I even did a couple more matches in the no gi, you know? And, um, and uh, man, after that was like probably one of the highlights, if not the highlight of my career, man, I'm telling you, you know, because it just, it just showed me what, what we're capable of, what, what I'm capable of. And I, uh, it was like a, in my subconscious, like, I got this, I got this multiple sclerosis thing. I got it, you know? And then my subconscious took me to the TACBIT certification, maybe like three, four months later. And I started on that. And so, um, like, like going back to the, the Scott Sauna and the guy who helped me for my UFC fight back in those back, back in that healed my neck. So I showed up and I did the first one. And then, uh, like, okay, I get a second chance to really do this. This and I started doing all the workshops and um, um, like everything I could do, you know, and I started to feel better. You know, I started to dream again. Uh, all the injuries that I had, you know, I, man, I was in such bad shape. I had a hard time. I could compete. Right. But afterwards, man, I, I had a hard time walking and even talking, you know, and uh, wow. and I, it was like almost impossible to my seatbelt on. I was just so like in so much pain. You know, I was taking ibuprofen every single day. My wife, you know, she's, she's like, she's known I've been doing that since forever for years and years and years, you know? And uh, once I did that certification, I stopped taking the ibuprofen and little by little, like my injuries started to kind of feel better, you know? And, 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 and I hadn't dreamt for like 10 years. I started dreaming again. Things started to heal from inside. I, said, I, I knew this was good for me. And I was trying, they're like hardcore, like these certifications and the workshops and stuff. And uh, I started to feel better from the inside out and I started to heal myself, you know? And uh, I, so I kept at it, you know, I kept at it and I kept, I got basically did like another like world tour. I went to every single certification workshop around the world, like Europe. I went to Brazil, even uh, you know, Central America. Like I went everywhere, you know, every single place all around the country. And I started to get better and better and better, you know, 
and it kind of gave me like my life back basically you know i was just like and so like and then a couple of years ago like they, they the things kind of fell apart you know uh like the the guy was there was a an italian guy that i was following around and it started falling apart you know like the business stuff and they never really had it together anyway you know um but uh it started kind of falling apart and uh and so I was trying to do my best to kind of keep it together, you know, like getting, hey, I'm interested in, you know, being a part or helping with whatever I can, you know, but there's a lot of egos and things like that. And, uh, and then I trained for, I was like, okay, so I put my head down and I trained for this, like their level two, it's like a team leader thing. There's like a YouTube video, like if you Google TACFIT team leader, Alberto Crane, it'll come up and it kind of tells my story a bit. Um, but, uh, it was like kind of mission impossible with all the injuries I've had, like on my elbows and shoulders and wrists and everything to kind of push like all that weight, you know? Um, but I, I just, I just followed like the system, all the, all the, all the, the principles and everything and, and followed it, you know, and, uh, put my foot on the, on the gas pedal and I went for it, you know, and, uh, just again, like, it was like, man, I, I can do this, you know, I can win, you know, and it was kind of like another, another step, you know, that I, I got this, you know, like the best is yet to come instead of my life being over, like the best is yet to come. And so then I, I was like, I started, I taught, tried to do everything right, you know, out of respect, respect to everybody that's, that's helped me. And I, I got involved, I got involved in this even now with the tactic and I'm working, I'm getting up like three in the morning and I, I work, I work my butt off, you know, on top of my legacy duties, you know, and my family duties, you know, we have, we have three kids. So I do my best and, but it's, it's, it's allowed me to do it like 18, 18 hours, you know, with all the time. It's a lot. And so like, I just want to give back what it's given me, you know, it's, it's given me so much. And everybody that's been doing it now for the last four years, you've done you've done a class, right, David? Yeah, at, I did. At, at, at Legacy, and so you know, I wanna I wanna see it grow, and it's like the perfect thing. And now, especially with this quarantine, right? It's like the perfect. <laughs> it really is the perfect thing, you know, to, yeah, to do it because yeah. it makes your jiu-jitsu better. It's all the components. You clean the components up, you know. You clean your movement, right? You clean the movement quality. You break everything down. It's just. His brain, like Scott Sana's brain, you know, he, he's that, that he, everything that he's put into it, you know, like your breath, the, the movement, the correct structure, the neuroscience, just all the, 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 you know, the work that he's put into it, you know, it's all there for you to be your best, you know. And he was a grappler, so of course it's very like a lot of like jiu-jitsu grappling moves, but it's like the technique and the level is just like it's, a, it's, a, it's the highest level, you know. Keep going down there, you know, that you you just keep going if you want to, you know. But even like basic things will like change your game, make you better a jiu-jitsu practitioner. Even if you're not a jiu-jitsu practitioner, it's like the same thing, you know, the, the, the structure is structure, right? Just makes you a better human, you know? So, uh, so yeah, I'm super grateful to kind of be able to do this work, you know, on top of jiu-jitsu, like jiu-jitsu is number one, jiu-jitsu is number one. It's made, it's given me the mindset, you know, to be able to do this tag for stuff, but tag fit was the right, it was the right tools. It was the right, you know, knowledge, right. That I needed, you know, and I think everybody needs it, you know, like, Nobody showed us like how to heal ourselves. Like Miss Miyagi, you know, and some martial artists, like they have yeah. like, like learning, uh, healing and recovery things, but nobody taught us these things, right? And so, uh, so um, Takvit has all that in there. And so it really makes you a complete martial artist. Um, so yeah, I'm really grateful that I have this in my toolbox now to, to, to help my students and to help others, help my friends, you know, a lot of my black belt friends. Like they're not, they're not doing good. You know, they can't really train anymore even, you know, a lot of people, I mean, you guys, and they're even like 30 years old or 35, like, and they're doing, you know, like they're walking <laughs> with canes and things like that, you know? I mean, it's like the sad truth, you know? They're all messed up, you know? But it doesn't have to be like that, right? Yeah. What's, what's that, Robert? I need help getting off a chair. I'm not even making this up. Like I use my arms because my knees are destroyed. <laughs> yeah, man, that's it, you know? But there's these there's things that we can do you know to you know yeah. to remove that synovi fluid like change the oil and you're eating in your knees you know and get your because it's your brain right like your brain remembers like traumas and different things that you did to abuse yourself and also pulling yourself in the opposite direction what we did like you know we do the same things over and over and over people take steroids and whatever else to kind of keep healthy but man it's not it's like knowledge is what we need knowledge is what we need and so like i love jiu-jitsu man i love what it does for people it's the tool you know for you to reach you to for you to be your best but it needs tact for two. It needs tact for two. You know, you need those two things, you know. And then, you know, especially if you're going back to the quarantine, it's like the perfect thing to have, you know, have people do, you know, to improve their jiu-jitsu solo wise, you know. But it's like a martial art with yourself, you know, and the, the battle is staying within that 60 to 80% of your heart max because that's where the magic happens, right? Because you need stress, but not too much stress. 
and keeping your breath with the correct structure and the movement, you know? So it sounds um, like you know, kind of simple, but it's, you know, you can go down the rabbit hole. It just takes time. It's like jujitsu. It's a skill. Uh, but in that process, man, you, you really, really get strong, get healthy. You really can live your best life because, man, I want to do jujitsu till till I die. I want to be on the mat. I want to be doing stuff till the end, you know, and I, I want my students, I want my friends to all have that same thing, you know. And so, yeah, tack fit, tack fit for me is where it's at. Uh, it's done so much for me personally because I had all these neurological, you know, things, right, going on with the MS, like multiple sclerosis, right? Like the, the MS, it, it, your immune system attacks your myelin, which is the, the, the sheath around your nerve, right? So you kind of get disconnected, right, in your body. So you become numb and, like, different things can happen, you know, uh, like neurological things where you just don't work, right? You're the, you know, you can't, you know, like I was saying, I could walk really well and even speaking and talking and thinking, you know? I couldn't read really. I couldn't study anymore. I used to read a lot when I was in my early twenties. Yeah, even when I was younger, and I couldn't comprehend, you know. Um, but I'm back. I'm back, you know. And not even that, but like my physique has changed, you know. Like I'm just, I'm just, I've, I've upgraded myself. And I was, it was all through that team leader training, you know. Just I, your body adapts to what you do, right? And it's just all the right stuff. We move in all the different directions, you know. Like jujitsu, you do right, but you know, have somebody else trying to, trying to, you know take you out right <laughs> so it's hard to it's hard to you know to, to to control yourself you know but this it's only you versus yourself so uh it's, it's amazing you know it's, it's, it's what it's what everybody needs you know it, it's what everybody needs as part of their training so, yeah uh, i find that oh, go ahead robert i'm sorry oh, uh, go, go. yeah i, I just want to go back to one thing you said a minute ago you said i wanted to give back to jiu-jitsu and I hear this from so many, and I feel the same way, right? I feel like so many people in the community or martial artists in general, they have that same feeling of like looking back and going, acknowledging everything the sport has done for them, right? So you feel like a sense of a debt towards the sport. Mm -hmm. right? Like I owe you just because you just done so much for me. What for has sure. there ever been for sure. where, because obviously it's, you know, you from what you listen to you speak, you sound like you're in a really good moment in your life. You seem really happy and positive about your journey, which is amazing. But has there ever been a moment where you went, like, I am done with jujitsu. I don't want anything to do. Not just, like, physically. Because we all feel, like, physically like that every day, I feel like. This shit hurts. Right? <laughs> but I'm talking, like, mentally yeah. exhausted. Like, man, like, I... I I'm, I've had it with jujitsu, right? Like, a down moment, like, a bad moment where Alberto went, you know what? I I'm not in love with jujitsu anymore. You know, it, it was hard, you know, when I, you know, like when you're like when you fight and you compete, like you just, you push past, right? You, you, you keep going, right? No matter what. And I mean, the people like you love, like your students, I love my students, you know? So, I mean, they're my motivation to keep showing up and to do it, you know, but for sure it wasn't a happy time. I didn't feel good after training, you know, I didn't feel good like day to day. I would be in pain, you know, for, you know, I don't know how many days after training, like I was telling you, I was taking ibuprofen every day. I was in bad shape, you know, so it wasn't fun, you know, and I wanted it to be fun because I love it, you know, but, and so those are moments before like the MS thing you know, that I just, I just, uh, I wasn't in a good place, you know, um, and myself personally, of course, I'm going to keep going and, and trying to help my students, but I was for sure, you know, not doing good myself personally, you know, like physically and just because I wasn't doing good, well, physically or mentally, you know, everything's connected. Right. And so, yeah. and you know, but I, you know, I'm, I love my students so much that I, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna quit, you know, I'm gonna keep showing up and, and I have to, you know, so that's, that's who I am. And yeah, so, but for sure, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't doing well. And uh, I don't think I ever wanted to say like, I wanted to quit per se, you know, but, but for sure, I wasn't, I wasn't doing well. I wasn't happy uh, compared to now. And so that was before, that was before like that MS diagnosis. And so it kind of put things in perspective, like, yeah, okay, you're right. Okay, that makes sense. Like I'm going numb in my arms. I'm going numb in my legs. I'm so stiff. Like there's something wrong for sure. You know, I had a lot of pain. I was tired. I was fatigued. You know, I would go in, you know, train and and I like, just want to sleep. Um, um, like a lot of things like that. So that's interesting so that well. uh, it's interesting how you approach that once you got the diagnosis because rather than throw yourself a pity party or submit to the fact that, oh, you're going to be 
disabled potentially, you, I, I, I think it's one of those things where you're like, I'm going to lose all this. I better enjoy it while I have it. Because you said that's afterwards you went on your world tour and started competing like crazy. Was there a part yeah. of you thinking that you, you might be losing it? So you have to go yeah, out and get that's as much it, of it as that's you can? It. That, that, that's it. You know, I thought, what if, uh, what if in six months, like I'm in a wheelchair, what happens in six months I can't grab anymore, you know? Those are the thoughts that I had. So, you know, okay, there was, uh, I, you know, it was, they, they were starting to open up the, like, these international tournaments. I grew up, I lived many years in, uh, in Germany, in Munich, Germany. So they had an IBJF in Munich, Germany. So I was one of, like, one of my first uh, international uh, tournaments that I did. So I was like, yeah, I want to give everything I have, you know, I want to give everything I got, you know. Um, and then, you know, I can, I gave, I gave them my best and you know, I gave it my all. Uh, if, 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 the day comes where I can't grab anymore or I can't, you know, I can't grapple. So, I mean, that's how I felt. Like, that's what you see, right? That's what you see. That's what, like, the doctors tell you pretty much, right? So it's really, like, you know, it's really fucked up, you know? It's really messed up. So so it's not that's not right, you know? And you can heal yourself with movement. It's like knowledge. And so that's what I'm all about, you know? Like, I'm about jujitsu, but I'm about, like, tack fit with jujitsu. Well, obviously, it's giving you back so much. You know, I feel like only recently, I, I'm nowhere near where you're at. But when I had the, my knee problem and the shoulder, it was getting me down, you know, because it was harder yeah, to move, sure. knees popping. Mm-hmm. And those things that you took for granted, your health, you know, that's one thing I would tell people. Health is only a need. You only feel the, the importance when you start to lose it, right? Like when you're very right, healthy, right. you're never like, oh, this is precious because you don't have perspective. It's like someone who has always had food doesn't know what being hungry truly is. You know, like mm, it's only mm. once you've starved yourself, then you understand, wow, how right. good it is to have food on, the, on your table right. or how precious right. water is. You know, so like when your health starts to fade, then you're like, oh, man, I, I took this for granted. And obviously you probably had the biggest trial of them all. I remember when they when the news came out that you had that, I was like, oh, Christ, you know, like just like you said, like doctors, say, it's kind of like a. It's like a set in stone, like, well, now you're done, you know, but obviously. Yeah, that's, that's all, all the nurses, all the doctors, that's, what, that's how they treat me when I was walking out of that office. And then when I was about to leave, you know, I was like, can I still do jujitsu to the main doctor? And he's like, sure. I was like, okay, good. And so I registered for a tournament. And I was just fighting MMA. I fought, you know, for like 10 years. So I registered for a tournament. And then I, you know, I went on that path on that, on that three and a half year, uh, uh, tour you know yeah and uh gave everything gave everything i had um but for sure like jiu-jitsu gave me the mindset right like you can have the mindset like that's you know that's all gonna have and then you know just going on that path right led me to that madrid that madrid tournament you know and uh really like i felt it you know like i felt the capability of the mind you know uh and jiu-jitsu gave me that mind jiu-jitsu gave me that mindset jiu-jitsu in brazil and my brothers and my my jiu-jitsu family and just the experiences I had, it just gave me so much. It gave me everything. It's given me everything in my life. And that's a, a good point that you mentioned there too, because like you yeah, said, yeah, that I get, wasn't... I get, I get, I get, I, get, I get, even got emotional. <laughs> I was crying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, that's how I know it was it very was important. Right. Fine, you can cry here if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it wasn't winning mundials or winning King of the Cage that stood out as a strong memory, right? It was just winning some, low, you know, some random IBJF tournament in Spain that has meant the most to you. And it wasn't because of the, the prestige. It was because of the adversity you have to conquer, right? And yeah. again, anybody can get that if they challenge themselves and, and push themselves, you know? So... It, it might not be the you know UFC championship belt, but you might be competing in a local tournament and going through some adversity like you, like you did, you know, where you feel like total crap. And everybody's been there at some point, but a lot of people just right. submit to it and they're like, okay, it's just not my day. Rather than trying to dig deep, you know, and and move past that because that like that type of strength of character that you showed sticks with you forever. Right? Like I always say, like That's it. when you when you have that type of toughness, it doesn't fade away because you always have that mm-hmm. memory. Like I am this tough. Mm-hmm. I have been through tougher stuff than this, so I can. And that's going to translate through everything in your life, you know. 
But if you're like, I think I, when I was sp- talking to my brother with Robert, he was talking about that as well. You know, like if you're like the guy that's cardio tapping at the gym, you're not building that toughness. You know, like you you can't allow yourself to just give up easily. You always have to fight really mm-hmm. hard. That's it. Was, you've, you're one of the people I would call a warrior, right? Like I always made the distinction between an athlete and a warrior. Where athlete, you know, when once they start getting bodily harm, they step out. You know, whereas a warrior. Yeah die you know before giving up yeah that's it that's it yeah i wonder like uh, people talk about experiences like these you know and i i hate being biased and of course we all are you know we're all going to say that jujitsu did this for us you know i think i think that you know i i wonder if other arts you get that sort of these sort of lessons i think that a lot but i biased as we are i am inclined to believe that very few endeavors in human life will you ever experience everything you experience in jiu-jitsu. I'll tell you why, and I think you guys are going to agree. You don't get the, 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 the extent of like the emotional hardship you go through, the physical, right, the, the, the level of concentration, the complexity of the technique, and it's, there's so many elements, man. Like you talk about sports. Sprinting, okay? Sprinting is physically hard. There's not a whole bunch of strategy. It's not the same as being in combat with someone who's trying to outsmart you. You know, like you, I think other experiences are more limited. Like we always compare it to chess. And I always think, man, jiu-jitsu is so much more complex than chess. It has to do with the human body. It has to do with emotions. It has to do with, you know, actually physically getting to have someone in your face trying to choke you out. It's so primal and it's so highly intellectual at the same time. I don't think that this experience that we have, other people can experience it the way we do. I, I maybe I'm biased, maybe I'm, I can't. You know, I think other people would disagree, but I I really feel like jujitsu is one of the most one of the most complex things you can do in life. Yeah, I definitely think it is just because, like, there's other sports, like, I think who was, like, Jerry Rice amputated a finger so that he could keep playing, you know, because he had broken it so bad. So, like, there's people who sacrifice a lot, but I think what makes, you know, jiu-jitsu and a, a lump in MMA in there as well is that there's a combination of things that other sports don't get. Like, for one, the weight cutting, right? Having to diet and, you know, deprive yourself of fluids and going through that it's a whole trial in itself, right? Like you see some guys cutting 20, 30 pounds and you can't like begin to understand how difficult that is and perform at a championship level. You know, whereas like you might be doing football or baseball, you don't have to worry about cutting weight. You never have to diet or like really suffer like some of these guys do. So that's like one level. And the other level is the one-on-one combat. When you have a team, the team can take some of the blame for you or they can pick up the slack. You know, if I'm weak today, at least my team could cover for me and we could still win, you know? Mm-hmm. But, like, when you're fighting, it's you. It's just you yeah, out too. there. And, and, like, you have to take all the blame and you have to take all the glory. So it, it's a high stress level. And I think the third thing is also, it's just, it, like you said, Robert, it's primal. It's combat, right? And there's something in combat that triggers an extra little switch. Like, that's why, like, we always say, like, when people compete in our team, we're always proud of them when they step on the mats because it's such a difficult thing to do. Like to me, like you think public speaking is difficult? Imagine fighting in public. <laughs> People are trying to kill you, you know, literally, and you're out there. So I, I think that, and then, and then even not talking about the complexity of fighting, there's so many techniques, there's so many strategies and approaches, and every body type is different. You know, like I, I think I, I 100% agree with you. I, I think we can say definitively it's definitely one of the more, most complex things just because of all the different factors, you know? I mean, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a reason, right? Like in MMA, right? No matter what culture, what area you're from in the, in the world, like you're going to understand what's going on in the fight, right? If you watch an MMA fight. Jiu-Jitsu, like it's a little bit different, right? But it's still the same thing. And what I love about Jiu-Jitsu is you don't have to get brain damage, you know. You can really put your and put everything into it, and w- it's without the brain damage. So I think really like a way of life, as a, as a way of life, man, jujitsu. Like just after fighting, like it just gave me like another appreciation of it, you know, from like little kids and their brain development to just as as you get older, it keeping you young, right? Because you're moving in all the different directions, and then of course the community and the 
the friendships and the brotherhoods and all that, you know. Um, but, uh, but, uh, you know, it keeps you, you know, it keeps you humble, right. It keeps you a good person, right. Because you're challenged, right. And you have to face death in a way, uh, at, you know, every time you train, right. You have to, you have, okay. to, <laughs> you have to be ready. And, you know, there's always somebody, there's always somebody, uh, you know, there's always somebody better, right. There's always somebody tougher. There's always things can happen. Even the guy that's not better, you make a mistake and they get you. Right. Um, so, so it's just something you have to face and just makes you a better person because of it. So like just being older and being, you know, being around it for so many years now, you know, it's, it's the best, you know, it's the best for sure. I think as far as way of life, a tool for living your best life. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, I think that's a great way to wrap it up. You know, um, man, like that's incredible journey there. Uh, Alberto, I wish, you know, we could probably, you know, we, I could probably keep talking to you for like hours and hours and hours. You probably have so much in common as Americans who've done like so much training. So we can go on with that theme forever. That's like a whole yeah. podcast. Yeah. I'm sure I've had yeah. tons of, I have tons of stories. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> man, you know, on here, I really, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, if you're ever in Vegas, I would love to have you at the gym. I know we've been talking about having me in, in yeah, LA. Yeah, your yeah. Gym. We'll get yeah, on. We'll work with it out. We'll work it out. We'll work it out. Once we get through this pandemic, for uh, sure. Man. <laughs> you know what? This start in day we're talking about how, you know, I have like a love-hate relationship with it because I, I you know, I'm concerned for depression. I'm concerned for my business, you know, economics, of course. For sure. Come in, of course. Big part, right? On the other hand, I've just discovered that I absolutely love being alone. I didn't know that. Been like you know, I've been like so many like phone all day, <laughs> but, you know, and I'm like now it's like quiet at home. Like you know, I got my books, I got my documentary, I got my guitar. That's actually really nice. <laughs> I like it. So I hope that you know when life kicks in again, I don't like stay in this like state of you know personal <laughs> inner, stay at home all day by myself. But dude, uh, we got to catch up at some point, man. I'd love to spend more time with you. For sure, for sure. Big pleasure. Big honor to, to talk to you guys. Thank you guys for having me on the show. Oh, uh, we'll a pleasure, Alberto. Uh, Alberto, before we, before we let you go, go ahead and plug yourself. You know, like, you know, where could people learn more about you? And in particular, like, I know Tac fits something you're passionate about. Yeah, you know, uh, you know um, my Instagram, Alberto Crane, my, uh, the Instagram, uh, at Legacy, Los Angeles, at Legacy, Glendale. We have a couple gyms in, in, in the Los Angeles area. Uh, TACFIT at TACFIT Instagram, but TACFIT.com, you know. But it, it, you can follow the Instagram or, or the Facebook TACFIT, you know, and you can you can start to read and, and learn, you know, YouTube's as well, you know. Uh, and and, how, and uh, you can watch them. Go ahead. How do you spell that? Uh, TACFIT, so it's like tactical fitness. So T A C F I T, TACFIT, like tactical fitness, yeah. Intelligence, check. right? It was called the world's smartest workout. The All right. World's smartest workout. Yeah. Robert, you should look Biden's into it because Robert health. had a neck stinger not too long ago. So when you were talking about how you had slammed in your neck, I'm like, hey, Robert. Oh. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. My best friend, my best friend, he's here with me now. Uh, you know, he tapped out like Jacques Ray back in the late 90s, man, in, in Purple Belt, you know. And uh, he, he's like a musician. He's an attorney. He's a lot of things, you know. But he couldn't train. He couldn't train. Because every time he would train, his lower back, his body, he just he couldn't walk for a week, you know. After so that tech kind of takes that away, and so I started showing him some of the things, you know, some of the flow, some of the movements, you know. And he started doing it, and he came into train. And he did the movements before and after, and man, he's he's training like every day. He's competing, competing again, and he has that a part of his life, you know. So it's a game changer. It's a game changer, and not just recovery things. It just helps you be your best, you know. The young guys need to do it you know because it's a it's a performance enhancer right it's like a it's like a you know um uh, unfair advantage in a way you know but it's it's all the right stuff like neurologically it makes you faster makes you stronger so it's uh it's, it's something else you know and it takes time to get right it's like a it's like a martial art it's like a skill right but uh the sooner you can get on it the the better it'll be for you <laughs> for everybody <laughs> awesome awesome thank you yeah. so much definitely check it out i definitely need it um yeah, man, thank you so much for being on the show, man. We we uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, let's do it again sometime. All Good. right, guys. Looking forward to it.
Thank okay. you, guys. Thank you. Ciao.